Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cindy Nellis. I'm the director of the Penn West Clarion Small Business Development Center, and we welcome you to today's webinar on Pennsylvania taxes for new businesses. The Pennsylvania, uh, um, the Pennsylvania Small Business Development Center, uh, we've established a partnership with the Department of Revenue to deliver monthly webinars that provide key information for business owners. And these four webinars includes today's webinar. Uh, we also have one that is titled Getting Started with My Path, uh, Sales Tax Basics, and Withholding Basics. Uh, so following today's uh, webinar, you will get information about uh, those other ones, and we hope that you join us for, for them. Okay. Just, uh, that's just a quick snapshot of uh, that particular series of webinars. I'm sorry that if it's a little bit blurry, uh, we'll make sure that you have that flyer. So before we get started, let me just review a few reminders for our webinar. Um, again, you'll get all the PowerPoints that you see today. You'll get a link to today's recording, the flyer you just saw, um, as well as any additional information that we identify that we need to give you. Uh, if you'd like to uh, ask a question to our experts from the Department of Revenue, we ask that you use the Q&A. And if you'd like to speak with me, your host here at the SBDC, please use the chat box. Uh, and that will just help us uh, run through the questions um, easier today. I do want to note that our, our webinar is being recorded just as a quick reminder. Uh, let's see, I can't seem to get my PowerPoint moving. Okay. Uh, real quick, I want to introduce you to the Small Business Development Center. We are a grant-funded program with a mission to help businesses start, grow, and succeed. We provide information, uh, education, and tools to help businesses make better business decisions. We do this through our one-on-one -on -one business consulting services, and of course, uh, an example, it would be training like we're doing today. Our consulting services are provided at no cost, and it's confidential. And we do offer a variety of training topics that target the needs of small businesses. The SBDC, we're here for any small business, with, which generally we define as any business with less than 500 employees. We use our funding to give businesses access to database information and resources related to conducting industry and marketing research, implementing marketing strategies and financial analysis. In Pennsylvania, we are one of 15 centers. All of our centers are hosted by institutions of higher education. We are a part of a national program called America's SBDC, which enables businesses and individuals all across the United States um, have access to our SBDC uh, tools, resources, and education. We encourage you to become a client of the SBDC to help you answer questions, access new resources, and find solutions and challenges that uh, your businesses face, um, and we hope that today can um, get you the answers to questions that you have. Now here, and you, again, you'll get this PowerPoint, we're giving you information on how to become a client, uh, links to our website, as well as our statewide website, and then information, e emails, uh, addresses to my center and to me. So there's no wrong door to connect with an SBDC. We're here to help you. We want you to know that um, and uh, you can connect with us a lots of lots of different ways. So uh, let's turn it over to our expert, Sarah Swieger from the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue. Sarah began her career with the Department of Revenue in 2015. She started in the Taxpayer Service and Information Center handling customer service calls for personal income tax, property tax and rent rebate, employer withholding and corporation taxes. In 2017, Sarah was promoted to really transfer tax specialist working in the individual tax division, and then returned to the Taxpayer Service and Information Center as a supervisor in 2018. She took a short break, worked for Highmark Health, but eventually returned to the Department of Revenue in her current position as a research analyst in the Customer Outreach, Relations and Engagement Division. 
So Sarah, we will turn it over to you. I will stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. And thank you, thank you so much for being here. Sarah brings with her um, a team of experts and they will be helping to address your questions while she's presenting. Okay, thank you very much. I do have my screen up. Can you confirm if it's coming up okay? Um, I do believe it looks okay to me. Okay, perfect. And I'll show my face so everyone can see me. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue's new business tax education seminar. Um, as Cindy mentioned, my name is Sarah Swieger, and I want to thank you today for participating in learning how the taxes will affect your business. In our experience, most taxpayers work very hard to comply with all the various regulations pertaining to their business. Obviously, tax compliance is one of the many areas that you must be aware of, and we recognize that tax rules aren't always clear. We have found that most tax delinquencies often stem from misunderstanding Pennsylvania laws and procedures. For that reason, we are reaching out to all new businesses to raise awareness about some common errors. Avoiding these common errors can actually save your business time and money. We hope that you find our presentation useful in building your knowledge about Pennsylvania taxes. The agenda lists the points that we're gonna to cover today. Uh, these are not random topics. Rather, these agenda points are the result of department research involving data analytics and business intelligence. In conferring with the leaders from the different areas of the department, including enforcement, audit, and customer service, these items were identified as the most common errors new business owners make whenever dealing with PA taxes. If you are a new business owner working with taxes or working for a company that has PA tax obligations, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to this information as it's going to help you or whomever you work for to succeed with the state tax side of your business. Okay, so let's get started and jump right in with income taxes. Businesses have an annual income tax filing requirement, the same as any other taxpayer. The type of business structure you have determines what form you'll be using whenever you're filing. Sole proprietors are going to report their income and expenses using a PA Schedule C, which is a profit or a loss for a business or profession for each of their businesses. The owner of a single member LLC that receives net profit income reports, its income and expenses using APA Schedule C as well, a profit or loss from business or profession. The owner of a single member LLC that owns and operates a rental property reports the income and expenses using a PA Schedule E, which is for rents and royalty incomes or losses. Partnerships and general and limited are required to file APA 20S slash PA 65 informational return and provide each PA resident partner with a PA schedule RK1 and each non-resident partner with a PA schedule NRK1 if the partnership is taxed as a partnership for federal income tax purposes. <clears throat> In addition to income taxes, you're also going to have what are called trust fund taxes. Trust fund taxes are collected by the business owner and then held in trust until they are paid to the Commonwealth. There are five taxes that represent trust fund money, but today we're only going to focus on the two that will most likely pertain, pertain to your business. Excuse me. Employer withholding of personal income tax is one and sales tax is going to be the other one. It's important to remember that these taxes must be reported timely and remitted in full to the Commonwealth. That is exactly how they got their name, is that we are trusting you to withhold them on our behalf. Please keep in mind that these funds should not be used to cover business or personal expenses, and we suggest that you keep these funds in a separate account until you're ready to remit them to the department. These are the five taxes that represent trust fund money. Some or all of these may pertain to your business. So let me provide a brief explanation of each of these. 
Sales tax is levied on the sale of taxable, tangible, personal property and certain services. If you review the REV 717, uh, which is the retailer's guide available on our website, there is a more detailed and complete listing of items and services that are subject to sales tax. Withholding tax of PA personal income tax occurs when an employer withholds state income tax from an employee's pay and remits the money to the state. The next three taxes are mainly associated vehicle leases and rentals and the new tire fee. Collectively, they all fall under what is termed PTA taxes. PTA stands for Public Transportation Assistance Fund Taxes and Fees. The vehicle rental tax pertains to car rentals from businesses with an inventory of five or more vehicles to rent. And these taxes must also, of course, be timely collected, reported, and then remitted to the state. Tax on liquid fuels is administered by the Department of Revenue. The tax is endured by the customer, although the distributor is liable for its collection and payment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Note that the trust fund taxes must be accounted for on the accrual basis of accounting. Accrual accounting looks to match revenues and expenses based on the business cycle of the firm rather than when the actual inflows and outflows of cash occur. Therefore, sales tax liabilities are recognized at the point of sale and not when the cash is actually received. So what is withholding tax? Withholding tax is when an employer withholds PA personal income tax from an employee's pay and remits the money to the state. In my path, you will see this broken down into three different withholding types. There is the normal W-2 employer withholding, which applies to normal regular employees. <clears throat> we also have a 1099 miscellaneous or NEC withholding, which applies to independent contractors. To tell the difference between an employee and an independent contractor, you're going to need to determine things like, is the worker being hired for a temporary project? Can they choose where and when the work is being performed? Do they use their own materials for the work that they're performing? And are they paid a flat fee or an hourly rate that is invoiced? If you answer no to all of these questions, then chances are they're just a regular employee. If there is any question about whether someone is a W-2 employee or an independent contractor, you should contact the Department of Labor and Industry. And lastly, we have a 1099-R, which is withholding that is taken on retirement income. <clears throat> In the state of PA, withholding is taken at the time of the retirement contribution, not the distribution of the retirement payment, provided that certain qualifiers are met at the time of withdrawal by the employee. So when do you need to withhold? If your business is a sole proprietorship, partnership, association, corporation, government body, or other entity that employs one or more persons, it is required under the Internal Revenue Code to withhold federal income tax from wages paid to an employee. Then you are required to withhold and remit Pennsylvania personal income tax from the compensation you pay to your employees. Currently, Pennsylvania's personal income tax rate is 3.07%. Pennsylvania law requires employers to withhold Pennsylvania personal income tax from employees compensation in two common cases. One is when the resident employee performs services within or outside of Pennsylvania, <clears throat> or when non-resident employees perform services within Pennsylvania. So when is it due? The current schedule for employers to withhold and remit employees' taxes on wage and salary income can vary. The frequency for remittance is based on the amounts of withholding that is required. So basically, the greater the amount of withholding, the more frequent you are required to remit that to the state. The return should be filed every quarter for this tax, and there's also W-2 reconciliation that is filed at the end of the year. So how do you exactly file and pay? The department offers um, two electronic filing options currently, which is MyPath and Telefile. MyPath is an internet-based filing system that allows taxpayers to file returns and payments electronically without a cost. 
You can find this website at www.mypath.pa.gov. Um, one thing to note is that you do need to have an account in MyPath in order to access your business accounts to file and pay. So if you have not yet created your profile or gained access to your business taxes, we do have instructional videos that are available on the department website, or you can attend one of the future MyPath instructional seminars as per the SBDC calendar. Telefile is the other option that I mentioned that is a telephone filing system that is designed for taxpayers who do not have computer access. Pre-registration is not going to be necessary in order to use Telefile. However, you do need to have either your account ID, your FEIN or social security number, your 10 digit revenue ID code and the period ending date of the period that you're looking to file for prior to you calling in. Telefile is toll free and is able to be accessed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The phone number for that is 1-800-748-8299. And you can find that phone number on our website as well, which is revenue.pa.gov. <clears throat> Under regulation, any payment that is $1,000 or more must be remitted electronically. Both MyPath and Telefile do have free options for you to remit your employer withholding tax payment electronically. One thing that's important to note is that some businesses think that just because they remitted the tax due payment on time that the tax return document can be submitted late or not at all. And of course, that's not true. If you do happen to do this, you are going to receive a letter from the department and there can be consequences in the forms of um, fees and penalties. So next, let's take a look at sales tax. Pennsylvania sales tax is levied on the retail sale, consumption, rental, or use of tangible personal property, including digital products and certain services in Pennsylvania. Currently, Pennsylvania sales tax rate is 6%. However, by law, there is a 1% local tax that is added to any purchases made in Allegheny County, and 2% local tax is added to purchases that are made in Philadelphia. Major items that are exempt from tax are going to include food, not ready to eat food, um, candy and gum, most clothing items, textbooks, computer services, pharmaceutical drugs, sales for resale, and residential heating fuels such as oil, electricity, gas, coal, and firewood. Generally, services to the human body are also exempt, such as haircuts, massages, um, what have you, <laughs> are going to be exempt from sales tax, and also permanent landscaping services that does not include grass cutting are also generally exempt. When you need to collect it, uh, sales tax must be collected at the time of sale unless the sale is on credit. Taxes due on credit sales must be remitted within 30 days of the date of the sale. A seller is liable for reporting and remitting taxes and fees with the tax return covering the period in which either the taxable sale was made or the tax or fee should have been collected. For those of you who are familiar with accounting terms, this is an accrual basis accounting. The most commonly used accounting method where a business reports income when earned and expenses when incurred, as opposed to a cash basis accounting, which reports income when received and expenses when paid. I'm going to talk you through this with a example. In August, you sell a widget to Sam for $1,000. Since the widget is a taxable item, you're going to charge Sam 6% sales tax, which comes out to $60. However, Sam only pays you $640 in August and promises to pay the remaining $420 in September. Under Pennsylvania law, you are required to still remit the full $60 of sales tax on the sale of the widget in August. Please be aware that a seller may be assessed for failure to collect taxes and fees plus charges for appropriate interest and penalties. I'm sure you have a lot of questions on uh, more items that are going to be subject to uh, 
sales tax. Again, the retailer's information guide that I mentioned earlier, which is that REV717, has a more complete listing of those services and items that are going to be subject to tax. So when is sales tax due? One thing you should be aware of about sales tax filing is that the filing frequency may vary. When you are a new sales tax filer, you're automatically going to default to being a quarterly filer, meaning that your returns are going to be due in April, July, October, and January. But your filing frequency is possible to change. Every year, the department reviews each business that files returns to determine whether or not the filing frequency needs to be changed. If such a change is made by the department, the business is then going to be notified in writing. We'll send out a letter to you. And it's important to pay attention to these notices because you don't want to be in a position where you're a quarterly filer and then it's been changed to a monthly filer and you're unaware of that change. This is one of the many reasons that it's important to make sure you also keep your address up to date with the department. So how to file. Like employer tax, we do have those electronic filing methods. Again, that is the MyPath portal or Telefile. You also have the option to use a third party vendor. As previously mentioned, with sales tax, you must also have an account for MyPath whenever you're attempting to file your sales tax return or remit sales tax payments. The department also has third-party vendors who are willing to provide e-filing software for those taxpayers who do not wish to use the department's e-filing options. There is a complete list of approved software vendors that's available on our website, which again is revenue.pa.gov. I want to remind you again that under regulation, any payment of $1,000 or more must be remitted electronically. So next we'll take a look at use tax. Use tax is by no means unique to Pennsylvania. Every state has a sales tax, also has a use tax. The purpose of use tax is so that Pennsylvania businesses are not put at a disadvantage to businesses who do not charge sales tax. Sales tax is imposed on taxable goods and services at the time of sale collected by the vendor. In instances where the vendor does not charge sales tax on taxable items, the purchaser is responsible for remitting the tax on their first use. This is use tax. Use tax expo exposure occurs most often when a business buys taxable goods over the internet or through the mail and the vendor does not charge PA sales tax. In these cases, the purchaser must pay their use tax obligation the month following the month of their receipt in PA. This is also true for purchases a business makes while out of state where no sales tax is charged. The items become taxable upon delivery into Pennsylvania. The department's audit experience shows that most businesses who use use tax, uh, but they do not pay use tax. It's estimated that upon audit, 80 to 90% of businesses are found to have owed use tax. Please be aware that use tax applies to individual consumers as well. So this is not just a business tax. Um, this can happen to any individual. There is a line on the PA40, which is your personal income tax return, which you are able to uh, list out any use tax that you may owe and send it in with your return or send in the payment as a return. Uh, we do have a use tax voluntary compliance program, which allows you to go through your records and voluntarily come forward and pay any use tax liabilities. Maybe you never heard of use tax before, or maybe you just didn't realize that no sales tax was charged. But rather than wait until we audit you and charge you fees, you can self-report any delinquencies and the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue will waive those penalties. These penalties can range from 5% to 25%. So how do you file and pay your use tax? <clears throat> Any business that incurs use tax liabilities on a regular basis is encouraged to register for a sales slash use tax account number by completing the PA online business tax registration application, which is also available on MyPath. Please be aware that you are, if you are looking to add this account and you already have an existing business account, you will need to be logged into MyPath so you don't need to fill out the entire application from scratch. If you have not registered any of your business tax accounts yet, 
um, then that is going to be a non-logged in feature since you will have to put in some basic information regarding your business. If you are already registered for sales tax, then you can file any use tax due with your sales tax return. If the sales tax return is filed timely, then the use tax is going to be considered timely no matter what filing frequency your business is on. If you are not required to be registered for sales tax and you have a use tax liability that needs to be paid, so let's say it's a one-time thing or it's relatively infrequent for you, you are still able to file the use tax return and pay it electronically via a hyperlink on the MyPath homepage without having to log into any type of profile. So while the sound of filing and remitting use tax seems a little bit unsettling, remember that our education enforcement of this tax may help level the playing field for your business. Without these efforts, PA businesses operate at a 6% disadvantage to online and out-of-state businesses. So let's look at an example. Taxpayer A opens a kitchen a supplies business. As part of their business, they need furnishings for their business office. They pursue different quotes to get the best deal. In the first instance, they get a quote from an out-of-state vendor who can ship the goods into PA via third-party freight. The out-of-state vendor is not required to charge sales tax. In the second instance, the taxpayer gets a quote from a PA business that, by law, must include sales tax. On first blush, it looks like the better deal is going to be with the out-of-state vendor. Many taxpayers would think that and make the purchase resulting in a lost sale from a PA business and a lost tax revenue to PA. However, applying use tax, the out-of-state vendor purchase price actually becomes $10,706. When the tax is calculated, it's actually the PA business who has the better deal. That is the purpose of use tax, to keep PA vendors from being undercut by out-of-state vendors. Sales and use tax would not apply on products purchased if you are selling it to a customer intact. So now I want to take a moment and talk to you about the Pennsylvania Exemption Certificate, which is also referred to as the REV 1220. This exemption form is used by a purchaser and seller to document the reason for and sale of taxable property or service tax free. If properly completed and when accepted in good faith, the REV 1220 will relieve the vendor from the collection of tax. Exemption certificates are required to substantiate all exempt sales with the exception of the following. One is sales to government entities, two is sales of non-taxable tangible personal property or services, and three is going to be sales where delivery is required to be made outside of the Commonwealth. There are a couple of important reminders for the PA exemption certificate. The first is that it is not a generic business exemption. When completing the form, the reason for why the property or service is exempt must be filled out and it must be signed and dated by the purchaser or leasee in order to be valid. Sellers should be aware that a hard copy exemption certificate must be kept on file by the seller and should show both front and back pages. Documentary evidence must also be retained by the seller on these transactions. We suggest that you staple a copy of the sales receipt to the exemption form. And please note that upon audit, you can be assessed for sales tax not collected based on an individual invalid exemption certificate. Okay, so now I'm gonna to talk to you about some tips for some tips for success resources that the department has to offer and the rates of both taxpayers and the Department of Revenue. The first tip for success is to maintain adequate records. A question that all new businesses have is, how long do I need to keep my business tax and records? There is no clear answer to that question since each business is different, but we are going to provide some general advice. Most of the time, the answer is going to be about four years, which means the current year plus the three previous years. For payroll, you're going to want to keep complete payroll records showing the proper withholding and remittance of Pennsylvania personal income tax and wage expenses for at least four years. 
For mortgage capital assets and investment records, you're going to need to maintain those documents throughout the life of the obligation. They're going to be used for depreciation and cost recovery calculations. For purchases made during a tax year, you're going to want to keep the records that will help to document current assets, inventory, and claimed expenses against income. Again, this should be roughly about four years worth. You also need to keep records of any sales tax paid by you at the time of purchase or use tax paid by you as needed. If you operate in multiple states, you will need to keep detailed records of Pennsylvania sales, as well as detailed records for every other state where you do business. You'll want to keep a file for all exemption certificates and write the transaction number at the top to make it easy for you to find in case you have an audit. While we can't re recommend any specific products to use for record management, we will let you know that there are various software products available that are going to help you keep your books and records in proper order. If you have a smartphone, we also recommend that you download a free scanner app that will allow you to use the camera to save PDF copies of receipts whenever you're traveling. The next tip for success is to keep your address up to date. We're going to talk about address updates, and we know that there are some who are thinking, who cares about that? This may seem like a minor thing, but it's often overlooked and important in helping us communicate effectively with you. Many taxpayers get behind on their tax obligations simply because they're not receiving the letters from the department. Usually it's because the items were sent to an old address or a completely incorrect address. Every November, the Department of Revenue reviews the amount of sales that an entity has. And again, this is to determine your filing frequency needs to be increased and to bump you up to a monthly filer instead of a quarterly filer. This is because you might have had an increase in your sales volume. If this is the case, again, I mentioned this earlier, we are going to send you a letter that is going to outline that your frequency has been changed and what that frequency is. If your address is not up to date, then you may not get the letter making you aware of this change. Delays in correspondence about overdue tax liabilities extends the time it takes to resolve them and causes additional charges like interest, penalty, and possibly collection agent fees um, that may accrue. You can easily update your address or other information, again, through our online portal on MyPath. Once you're logged into your profile, you'll want need to go to the More tab and then Names and Address panel. From there, there is going to be a hyperlink for Manage Names and Addresses, where it will take you to a page that you can make the appropriate updates. Again, we do have detailed instructional videos that will walk you through step by step. Um, they are referred to as our 411 videos. And as I mentioned earlier, they are available on the department website. If for some reason that doesn't work, um, we do have a paper form, which is the REV 1705R, the Tax Account Information Change Correction Form. You're able to complete that and then you can mail it in. Uh, as always, we do encourage using electronic options just to prevent any delays in processing. Doing it online is a much more quick and effective way to get that updated. So our next tip is to file and pay on time. Uh, for income taxes, this is a generally once a year event for you and your business. We can't tell you the number of times we've heard someone say, I forgot they were due. Failure to file and pay income taxes or estimated tax payments that are due can result in a penalty and interest charge. Another feature on the MyPath portal is that you are able to set up due date reminders for all of your tax accounts to ensure that you're compliant with your filing and payment deadlines. For trust fund taxes, due dates vary depending on the amount that you are regularly collecting. So be sure to educate yourself on your business's filing and payment frequencies. As I mentioned earlier, there is information on our website pertaining to both employer withholding and sales tax obligations. Again, the department applies penalties for late filing as well as late payment. So be sure that you are properly submitting everything on time. Uh, next up, we have keep separate bank accounts for trust fund taxes. We recommend this to you for you to keep a separate bank account to hold your trust fund money and to pay the tax due from that. 
If you don't keep it separate, you could potentially end up spending trust fund monies and not realize you're doing it. In general, it increases the chance of you accidentally misusing your tax money. As mentioned earlier, you cannot use trust fund money for business or personal expenses. It's important to know that using trust fund money for anything can be considered a criminal offense. Our next tip is to take advantage of our electronic services. Again, I stated this earlier, this is the fastest and most effective way to get anything done. Whenever we were in quarantine back in 2020, our entire building had shut down due to COVID and there was no one in office to manually process any items that were mailed in. Using electronic services ensured that everything kept moving even when you take people out of the process. Some of the things that you can do through MyPath is, again, schedule your due date reminders so that you receive a notification whenever your filing or payments are due. You can view, save, or print notices both from the MyPath system and the old eTide system. You can request an electronic statement of account, which allows you to see how payments are applied and what credits you have sitting on your account. The nice thing with requesting it through the portal is that it is immediately available to you in your inbox as opposed to the old way where we would have to mail it out and it would take like seven to 10 business days. Um, you are also, of course, able to make electronic payments. I've said that a few times throughout this presentation. Um, anything, again, can't harp on this enough. Anything $1,000 or more must be made electronically. Otherwise, we are going to issue out an electronic funds transfer penalty or an EFT penalty. So, of course, the best way to avoid that is to make your payments online. The department does have instructions available for each of these services under our online customer service center, uh, which we're going to talk about in a little bit for our additional resources. And just to keep it in mind, this list represents only a few of the things that you can do. There is a lot more that you can do through this portal, so we strongly encourage you to go check that out if you have not already taken a look. Um, on the screen, you will see the image of the homepage as far as what's available. One thing to note is that anything you're seeing hyperlink-wise on the screen right now is actually a non-logged in, func non in function. So you are able to do quite a bit without a profile. And last but not least, we have to safeguard your data. As a business owner, it's important to protect your data and confidential information at all times. So let's go over some things to help ensure your systems are secure. You'll want to install anti-malware or antivirus security software on all your devices, including laptops, desktops, routers, tablets, and phones, and automatically update the soft software. Uh, we encourage you to use strong passwords of eight or more characters and use different passwords for each account, password protect wireless devices, and consider a password manager program. Encrypt all of your sensitive files and emails. Uh, back up sensitive data to a safe and secure external source not connected full time to a network. Make a final review of uh, return information, especially direct deposit information prior to e-filing. Wipe clean or destroy any old computer hard drives and printers that may contain sensitive data. Limit access to taxpayer and employee data. And last but not least, you want to check the IRS e-service account weekly for a number of returns filed with an FEIN. If you or someone affiliated with your business feels like they're a victim of fraud, you're going to want to contact the Fraud Detection and Analysis Unit. They are here to help you for those types of situations. So now that we've reviewed some tips to help you be successful, uh, let's go over some resources that are also going to help you achieve success. So a lot of people ask, where can I get useful information on Pennsylvania taxes that affect my business? If you're not into reading the tax law, uh, I recommend going to the department website, once again, revenue.pa.gov. This slideshow is what, or on this slide, I should say, is what our homepage currently looks like. Uh, we are in the process of revamping the website continually to making it more user-friendly. So be aware that sometimes there might be changes or updates that are made to the screen. 
Currently, a lot of the information that you need is either going to be in the top toolbar or in the icon belt down near the center of the screen, which are both highlighted in red. From the top toolbar, you can easily navigate to our online services, forms and publications, or get assistance. And you're also able to obtain other general text information. The middle icon belt provides access to our most popular services. So here you'll see See, make a payment. Where's my read for customer service? Our website is compatible with all devices. This, for example, is the mobile view, meaning that you can access it at any time, anywhere, even from your smartphone. Most often, people are visiting our website with a specific question. So I want to talk to you about how to use our online customer service center. First, you're going to want to click either the image at the top of our website where it says learn more or select the icon in the center that says customer service. <clears throat> Once you click the customer service icon, you're going to type in your question in, or search term um, and you can see what you discover. So you'll want to do that at the top bar or top bar. The Online Customer Service Center also contains answers to thousands of commonly uh, asked tax questions. If you have any tax questions that are still not answered, you can submit the question to us. To do that, you will need to click the top bar that says submit a question. This does require you to create an account. Once you've logged in and you have access to over 30 categories that let you direct your question to the proper place. Before going any further, I just wanna remind you that um, we all strongly encourage you to search for what you need first before you submit your question. Our FAQs are all vetted through the department's subject matter experts before they are placed online. So you can feel confident that the answers you're getting are good answers. Once you've submitted your question, you will immediately receive a confirmation code or notice and an individual specialized in that area will respond to your request in about 72 business hours. If you would like to actually talk to a representative on the phone, you are also able to contact the department's customer experience center, which is open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. One thing I like to point out and remind everyone is that we do observe most, if not all, federal holidays. Um, so on those days, we may be closed during the week in observation of a holiday. And uh, of course, you will not be able to get a hold of anyone at that time. Our representatives in the Customer Experience Center are all trained to handle almost all calls for the department. So keep in mind that right now, many of the department's phone lines uh, were shut down due to COVID. A lot of them have opened back up, so we want to make sure that you are contacting the Customer Experience Center to get your questions answered. If you don't want to wait on hold or you can't find your answers online, you are able to use our schedule a call feature to select a date and time that works for you and one of our representatives will call you back. We do ask that you please allow a few minutes from your scheduled time. Uh, we do try to do our best to maintain the schedule, but it could vary slightly depending on the volume of request. So if you request something for two o'clock and it doesn't come through by 2.05, um, it could be 2.10 potentially. So just give it like a small window um, for us to get back to you. Uh, to access this feature, you're gonna click the schedule call icon, which is right on the department's so homepage. Should you need any face-to-face -face customer service, uh, you are always able to visit a district office that is closest to you. Currently, to comply with the Department of Health social distance guidelines, our district offices are operating at a limited capacity and by appointments. Therefore, if you intend to visit one of our district offices, we do encourage you to call ahead. Creating an appointment to visit with someone and to go over your information, your returns, whatever your question is, is going to be the most effective way to utilize your time, um, just to make sure that you are able to go everything properly. There is a list of district offices and their contact information is available on our website.
Okay, so last but not least, we want to go over some things that are your rights as a taxpayer. We have recently revamped the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Pennsylvania has a Taxpayer Bill of Rights that ensures equity and fairness in tax administration and enforcement. The Taxpayer Bill of Rights sets for sets for uniform procedures so that Pennsylvania Department of Revenue treats all taxpayers equally and fairly. As a taxpayer, you have access to the following guarantees. The right to quality service. If you ever feel that you do not receive this type of assistance, please share your experience by visiting our website and completing our customer service feedback survey. You have the right to be informed. Taxpayers have the right, of course, to be informed and receive clear and easily understandable communication from the department. The right to confidentiality. The department will not disclose taxpayer information unless we are authorized by the taxpayer or by law. We take confidentia confidentiality here very, very seriously. The right to retain representation. Taxpayers have the right to retain an authorized representative such as a CPA or an attorney to represent them. And finally, you have the right to challenge the department's position and to be heard. For your right to challenge the department's decision and be heard, you can file a petition to the Board of Appeals, but it's important to know that there are appeal timeframes which will need to be followed whenever you're petitioning to the board. The general time frame to file an appeal with the Board of Appeals is about 60 days from the mailing date of an assessment notice. If a taxpayer is not satisfied with the decision of the Board of Appeals, they may file a petition uh, with the Board of Finance and Revenue. The general time frame to file an appeal with the Board of Finance and Revenue is 60 days from the mailing date of the decision of the uh, Board of Appeals. To appeal that decision, a taxpayer may file with the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania within 30 days of the mailing date of the decision of the Board of Finance and Revenue. For specific appeal timeframes for each tax type, you'll want to refer to the REV-460 as well as the REV-1799A. So I discussed the rights of taxpayers and the representatives. So now I wanna go over some of the department's rights. Earlier, I talked about record keeping. This ties into the department's right to audit. Keep in mind that we don't perform audits just to find out what businesses are doing wrong. It's more of a standard business practice to ensure that everyone knows how to do things the right way so that all businesses are treated equally. Anytime an audit is conducted, the department will provide the taxpayer with a complete explanation of the audit findings for that individual taxpayer and their rights during that process. So again, if you do get an audit notice, do not be alarmed. It does not mean that you did something wrong necessarily. Audits are just a standard business practice of the Commonwealth. We're having this session today so that you do not land here. We wanna let you know that the department does have these options, but we are trying to help you avoid any further enforcement. If you do not file a return, pay the tax due, or file a timely appeal for a tax balance, the department does have the option to use the tools that are listed on this slide. The left side of the slide shows some of the more common enforcement tools, while the right side are tools that we use when we receive a little cooperation from taxpayers. Again, our goal in inviting you here today is to help you avoid the scenarios where any of these tools are used. So now you may wonder why we have a second slide on enforcement. Once again, trust fund taxes are treated a little bit differently. Failure to timely collect and report sales tax money can lead to civil penalties equal to 50% of the unpaid tax and criminal penalties for theft, embezzlement, or misappropriation of government funds. This is in addition to the standard penalty and interest. This is an example of the, where the cost of noncompliance ends up being higher than the cost of compliance. Something that's unique to trust fund tax liability is that it attaches to the responsible party. The law says that the liability is enforceable against, quote, such person, his representatives, and any person receiving any part of such fund. 
On a practical level, this means that the owner of a limited liability company that goes out of business with unpaid trust fund taxes still remains liable for those taxes. The liability doesn't go away with a defunct business. That means that the department will pursue collection against the individual using all available enforcement tools, including liens. Again, we don't want you here. We are meeting today to help you understand your responsibility so that you do not end up in this situation. Previously, I talked about protecting yourself so that you don't become a victim of fraud, but this slide is telling you what to do if you suspect someone else is reporting fraud. Tax evasion is a crime that hurts all Pennsylvanians because when taxpayers don't pay their fair shares, it decreases the revenues available to fund essential state programs and services. If you suspect tax fraud, report the activity directly to the PA Department of Revenue, including as much detail as possible. You can use the contact information listed on the slide, or you can just go to our website and type fraud in the search box and report suspected tax fraud activity will pop up. If after listening to this presentation today, you find yourself thinking you may have a tax requirement that you're not aware of, we do have the Voluntary Disclosure Program, which is also referred to as the VDP. The program was created for individuals and businesses that have not met their tax obligations because they were not aware of them. The department's liaison officer will work to make sure that all of the taxpayers' filing and payment requirements have been fulfilled. There are incentives for coming forward. In return for voluntary disclosure, filing the tax returns, and clearing tax debts, taxpayers are only responsible for the payment of the tax and interest. Penalties for all taxes administered by the PA Department of Revenue will be waived when the requirements of the voluntary disclosure agreement have been completed. It's important to know that the program is only available to those taxpayers who are not registered with the department and for which no investigations or collection actions have begun. Of course, we want you to know that we do have several social media platforms, such as LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. We generally use these outlets as a mean to push information to taxpayers as well. We do post tax law changes, um, some of our fast facts, events, and anything that is new going on with the Pennsylvania Taxes or Department of Revenue on these platforms. <clears throat> so whether you're thinking about starting your own business, expanding your existing company, or are considering a move to the Keystone State, the Business One Stop Shop website, which is business.pa.gov, is going to provide useful information to help you work smart and live happy in PA. If you have any general questions that is related to starting or expanding your business, local earned income tax, local business assistance, state permits, or need information regarding unemployment compensation, workers' compensation, or new hire reporting, the Business One Stop Shop is exactly where you want to be. We do have a PDF attachment with information for this site as well. This is a good starting point for any new business owner. All impacted Commonwealth agencies have come together to create a single place for new business owners to get information rather than needing to know who to contact for what. It is all right there. The REV588 and the previously mentioned REV717 are valuable resources for new businesses in identifying items and services that are subject to sales tax. Both guides are available on the Department of Revenue website under Forms for Businesses. So finally, this concludes my presentation for the day. We want to thank you and we want to know how much we respect your desire to have a successful business enterprise in the Commonwealth. And as such, we are here to help you the best that we can. Your success is our success. We hope you have found this presentation informative and helpful. We do wish you the best in the new year. And before I sign off, are there any questions that are lingering out there? Sarah, thank you so much. Um, I guess uh, the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna launch a poll. And while I do that, I will just remind everyone that yes, uh, the recording will be shared. 
Uh, the PowerPoints will be shared as well. It usually takes me about a day or so to get the, the recording finalized so that I can send out the link. And the links, uh, a, a link that is um, live or available for about three months. In addition, I just want to remind everyone that I will also be sending a follow-up email um, shortly after we finish today. That will have a survey in it that comes from the Small Business Development Center. Uh, it asks about a dozen questions. We're really trying to get uh, your uh, feedback on today's webinar, but also feedback on the format and the content of training that you are interested in. Um, we, let's see, so I have answered, will we be saving the chat? Yes, that is part of the recording that comes out. And I believe uh, Alicia is typing the answer for Kimberly and um, Lords has a question. And I think really the answer to that is it really just depends. But if you'd like to, Sarah, address that question, he asks, how does my... How, it looks how like Don's that? typing. <laughs> yes. Okay. And Don's typing an answer to that question. So uh, if anybody has a specific question, um, I also like to let everybody know that if they have a question that they would prefer to ask um, live, that all they have to do is let me know who they are in chat and I can open up their microphone so that they can be a little bit more specific or provide a little bit more detail than what they can type into um, the Q&A. So since we have just a few minutes, I always want to throw that option out there to everyone. But Sarah, you did a great job. Thank you so much. Not a problem. And we did have quite a few questions. So Alicia, we were extremely busy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to end the poll. Um, thanks so much, Sarah and Don and Alicia for being here with us. Um, I don't see any more questions. I don't see anything in the chat. So I think we're gonna finish up for today. Um, again, uh, you will be receiving the PowerPoint presentations and uh, the recording. Um, and we hope to see you back here next month uh, for sales tax basics. So thanks everyone, have a great day. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you.